Welcome to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and today I think you're going to enjoy our conversation with Dr. Adam Wyatt. Adam currently serves as a senior pastor of Corinth Baptist Church in McGee, Mississippi. He received his Ph.D. in biblical theology from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and we'll be talking to him about his new book, Biblical Patriotism, an Evangelical Alternative to Nationalism, But before we hear from Adam, let's go to Ed Setzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Executive Director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. So I sought out Adam to be on the podcast because it's it's right around. Now, we have listeners around the world, millions of listeners (laughs) around the world, Uh, but coming up, you know, July 4th. And so um, I write an article, uh, Cautions Regarding Patriotism and Worship, that I published a few years ago. I, I do a variation of each year, and boy, do people get mad at me. Uh, because my, my concern is actually, I, I love patriotism. I love my country. Um, I We read the Declaration of Independence as a family mm. regularly uh, in and around July 4th. My wife's a Canadian immigrant, so my kids are dual citizens. So I need to remind them how awesome <laughs> America is. But I tend to do that outside of my local church experience. So when I saw Adam wrote this book, um, I, I wanted to know. I want to have a conversation with him. So we're excited. And let me encourage you to ke- check out an extended portion of this interview at churchleaders.com slash plus. We do that with several interviews. And if you're enjoying our interviews, it would help us if you left a review. So Adam, into the lion's den you go, because I've got opinions. I'm guessing you got opinions. But we got to start right. with some of the definitions here, right? You, you're literally saying that there's an evangelical alternative to nationalism, and it's some form of patriotism, so we need some words defined. Would you help us by defining those words as you use them and as people talk about them today? Sure, sure. And and obviously, over the last few years, these these terms have clearly shifted. And, and again, I think that's one of the, the issues for church leaders and pastors to figure out uh, one, how the, the, the landscape is both changing, but also how we can understand it. So uh, when I went into this project, which was my dissertation uh, basically being published, uh, when I tried finding good, solid uh, evangelical and theological uh, uh, sources on what patriotism is and nationalism is, I realized there just really wasn't a whole lot out there, especially in regards to patriotism. You saw a lot out there on nationalism and other uh, other principles, but uh, wasn't a lot out there about patriotism. So I realized that if I was going to write something on patriotism, I was really going to have to come up with my own definition because so many people use nationalism and patriotism interchangeably and, and some are, are pro both and some use them wrongly. And so for me, uh, patriotism, the way I define it is it's rooted in loyalty for our country, our home country, uh, our land, our people, and our culture. And uh, I actually make the claim that 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 a proper biblically informed patriotism is an alternative. It's the proper alter- alternative to both nationalism and cosmopolitanism, although I recognize that both of those are almost bookends of patriotism. And so uh, for me, nationalism is a seeking to exalt our country over others. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily biblical because uh, God has both uh, created all people and all nations, and he's created us all equally in bag, value, dignity, and worth. And I also don't think cosmopolitanism is good because it seeks to ignore nations and say we're all citizens of the world uh, because God has created all nations. Uh, and because of that, they all have dignity and worth. And so you can't just say they don't they don't matter. And so patriotism should be somewhere in this middle, although in the middle, there's a lot of leeway and a lot of differences there. And so that's where the tension exists. I think I, I think I first heard maybe it was James Sire and others talking about being a world Christian. And so uh, for some, and I've heard some say that I should think of myself as a citizen of the kingdom of God. I think that's right out of many biblical passages. And then see myself as a world Christian. You're actually advocating for also seeing myself as part of some national entity. So why not just be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and a world Christian? Why also be a patriotic citizen of your nation? Well, because God's blessed you with your nation. I mean, and and wherever we are now, obviously, I'm writing this from an American perspective. uh, And I recognize that, you know, when I'm called to submit to my country or to my leadership, it's a little bit easier for me to do that in in rural Mississippi than it would be if I was a Christian in North Korea. I mean, and obviously, there's tensions there that we have to wrestle with. But, uh, but I think that that God has given us our countries. I mean, that, that is a part of how God's created and wired the entire world. And so I don't think we should just seek to ignore that um, because we've been called to be neighbors. And, and I do think that obviously 
that does mean that we love all people. Um, but I, I do think that, that, you know, I literally have next door neighbors, you know, and, and, and I, and I think I can't ignore that at the, at also trying to, to say that I'm a citizen of the world. So I, there is a tension there that does exist, but, um, but obviously I have more in common here with my, the people that, that I would say are, are my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in my church, but also how I have people that, that are around me that I have in common because simply we, we share our citizenship. I think when you wrote the book, it was probably right around the time of the 2020 presidential election uh, in around that time. Like, what do you think the election itself uh, showed us about patriotism and nationalism? Yeah, what's interesting is, is I, I actually got it published recently, but I started the the, the initial framing of the, the book in 2015. Oh, and wow. so, what, what, yeah, and so that, to be honest, obviously, when you start your dissertation, you kind of have to stay with it. And so really 2020 was just a firebomb because I was finishing everything around that time. And of course, you've got the, the election cycle and you had uh, George Floyd and you had a, uh, a seemingly new civil rights movement and you had the country saying you need to wear a mask and you must shut down and churches need to shut down. But the Walmarts are open and how do we submit? And all of these things were coming to uh, to the forefront. And then the, the worst election cycle I've ever been at. And then, you know, I wanted to start my last chapter the, after the election. So I waited purposefully to see who won to figure out how I was going to close everything out. And then I realized, oh, now I don't even get the luxury of knowing who the president is. And so how do all these things, how do all these things kind of come up is, is that the church finds itself in this weird moment where we are political people. And I don't think it's wrong to be political. God's given us in our country the ability to vote. And I'm thankful for that. Um, because we actually have a role to play in the political process, but also at the same time, because of social media and division and disunity and different opinions, you know, there's no middle ground anymore. And, and that is really hard um, because you see this now in just in church in general, because, you know, you're either here, or you're here and there's no middle ground anymore, it seems to be. And so patriotism um, has become a toxic word, I think, and I think that's unfair. Um, so I think what we're seeing is this extreme. And even if you think about it over the last year, at first it was it was nationalism, then it became Christian nationalism is what we're talking about now. It's white Christian nationalism. So the so the goal, or not the goal, but the the definition or the goal line is moving. And and so because it moves, it's becoming more and more difficult to actually have a reasonable conversation about it. Yeah, and I and I do think that Christian nationalism is a thing. I, I co-wrote an article with Andrew McDonald sure. in the Dallas Morning News. It's time we evangelicals have a talk uh, about Christian nationalism. And my the subtitle they put on was, was right though. Christian nationalism is not patriotism, which can be a moral good, nor is it Christianity. But but we're talking a lot about what this ultimately is. And and I want to go right to our audience of pastors and church leaders though, because one of the things I want us to to think through is. Um, I get uncomfortable. I remember sitting in a church service once, and, and I, I don't like if I, I'm usually the interim pastor now. I'm not the real pastor. So churches sort of have their patterns and more, and they sometimes do um, do big America, you know, Sunday before July 4th things at Moody Church. We did a big, big thing for that yeah. before COVID. Um, and, and again, Moody Church, I'm, I'm for what they're doing. Uh, and they're pretty careful, actually, I should be clear. But I've also been in places where I remember watching somebody sing arms raised, full on worship mode, America the beautiful. America, America, God has shed his grace on thee. And I got to tell you, I, if I had walked in and I was Malaysian, I would have been confused as to what they're actually doing. So we're coming up on that Sunday before. Um, I'm interested. What would you recommend? Maybe even what do you do? You're in rural Mississippi, a town of under 5,000 people. Um, you know, Mississippi is different than Illinois for sure. So, uh, so what, what would you advise and how might we walk around worship and patriotism, which is an area I've, I've expressed concern before? Sure. Um, and, and, you know, one, you know, the Bible tells us in Romans uh, 12 to give honor to whom honors do. And I don't, you know, so I, so for example, it's not just um, July 4th, you know, it's Memorial Day, it's, it's Veterans Day, it's, there's all of these what I call patriotic, um, really days of, of patriotic liturgy where it's very pronounced. And, 
And so I think there's lots of different ways to look at it. And I think one, as a pastor, you know, you can have your own personal opinion, I think, but you've also got to be sensitive to your people yep. while also trying to lovingly shepherd them well. And so I think there's a tension. You're right. You know, rural Mississippi is going to be a lot different than Chicago uh, and other places. And so I'm going to have to walk with that a lot differently. Um, but also I, I, I have to look at it. And I think pastors need to look at this. You need to look at it with the long game in mind too. You know, it's slow, you know, but, I, but I've had a conversation once where, you know, some, I think we had moved some, we moved the flags in our sanctuary. This was years ago. To, and I don't remember what it was for. It may have been for vacation Bible school or something, but they didn't get put back right. And, you know, little sweet sister say, well, you know, brother, I can't, I can't worship if the flag's not in there. And I'm like, well, mm. you know, that we probably need to pray through that because that's not really what we need to be worshiping or, or thinking about. I don't think she meant it that way, but that's what she said. And so I think as a pastor, you use those opportunities to, to admonish and correct, just like you would on any other issue. I think you do that out of love. And so how do I, how do I look at, it? I think there's lots of different ways that you can, you can frame uh, patriotic liturgy, but, I, but ultimately we just can't argue with the fact that uh, we're supposed to, to make much of Jesus when we gather. He's the goal. He's the end. And so I think we have to, to be very, very careful there. But at the same time, uh, you know, the Bible says to, to pray for our leaders, you know, like it's biblically commanded. There's nothing wrong with incorporating those things into our services. And, and I don't think it's wrong to, to be thankful for those that really have, you know, sacrificed so much to protect us. And uh, you know, 9 on a Sunday this year. We're going to be uh, doing a community-wide first responders banquet just to say, man, we appreciate you and love you and, and want to serve you and thank you for doing what you guys are doing. Uh, and so I think there is a tension there. Uh, but I think as a pastor, not necessarily as a theologian, but just as a pastor, I think you've got to, to be savvy enough to know how to navigate it. But you don't have to fix it all at once. It can be gradual. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to get into some of the practicals about that, because you mentioned the the flag. And, you know, I think 20 years ago in my church, you know, if the flag was there, I don't think most people would have questions. But I think given what we talked about in the 2020 election, you know, the flag will stay in the same place, but people look at that differently. So, Adam, I'm wondering as a pastor, how do you talk to your church about those issues? You know, um, I grew up in a church where our Baptist hymn, hymnal books had a lot of patriotic songs in it. And um, I think young folks would turn to those hymns today and feel maybe even slightly offended. So, it is kind of a generational thing, too. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so how do you navigate that conversation yes. on the ground level with your congregants? Yeah, uh, and, and that is, I do think there's a lot of that is, is generational. And I just think, I think you clearly see that. Um, and, you know, when we're thinking about cultural symbols, whether it's a political symbol, Christian symbol, when you're talking about a symbol, um, the flag is a such a strong symbol. And, sure. and I, I go I go through some of that in my book. I mean, it's such an incredible symbol. But also we have to remember that the symbol symbols just mean different things to different people. And so, you know, my dad was in the military. I was blessed to, to, to live all over the world. And uh, I live I was living in West Germany when the Berlin Wall came down. I still wow. vaguely remember that as a kid. And and so uh, I remember going to movie theaters and on, on base and instead of previews of movies, you had the national anthem and you stood up, you know, so I, I, so I am deeply patriotic and I know that uh, that most people really are. And so how you have those conversations is I think you have, have them one on one. And uh, when you when you're preaching through texts that deal with certain things, you don't gloss over them, you know, that it's OK to say, yeah, I love my country, but also say, you know what, we. Americans, we have to reconcile that we can't necessarily necessarily say we're a Christian country when we've, you know, aborted 60 million babies. Like that's that's a real life issue. And so, just because we can love and appreciate and find good things about our country, we also need to be able to speak truthfully about where we are as a country. And so, uh, so while you know the the flag probably even for myself may have shifted over the last 20 years in my own understanding, we also need to understand that it means different things to different people. Uh, and so you can't just assume that what it means to you is what it means to me. It's the same thing of using terms like patriotism or CRT or woke. Like these terms mean so much, so many different things to so many different people. And so I think pastorally, let's not make, let's not make the mistake of thinking when we're talking about these terms that everybody's coming from the same understanding. 
Yeah, Christian today did a uh, did a question list of these things before, and they asked the question: Do flags belong in churches? Pastors around the world weigh in. This was actually July second, twenty twenty one. Morgan Lee, my former colleague there when I used to be at, at CT, wrote about it, and um, and it's interesting because from Egypt, they have different people from different places says yes, the flag should be there. Uh, from Jordan, yes, the flag should be there. Uh, from from uh, from Indonesia. Uh, we display our national flag in the sanctuary every August, so kind of around the Independence Day, which is August 17th. So it's interesting to see the difference. I had, before I read this, I assumed that it would be more common in an American context, but it's actually pretty common around the world, less so in places like the Philippines, according to the Assemblies of God leadership there, um, and more. So part of what comes to mind for me is, is, you know, at what point is the flag representative of Good and representative of evil. I'm, I, I'm, I'm unapologetic. Say I'm a patriot. I'm patriotic, and I, I think America is generally a force for good. Um, so, but there are countries that are not. I mean, if you're right now Russia invading Ukraine, the churches in how do churches in Russia uh, live out patriotism? You mentioned North Korea uh, and others. Uh, you know, communist China. So, we want to apply these things in ways that are that are consistent biblically. And uh, America, as you already mentioned, some of the, uh, the moral issues, it's not, this, not every way, I, was, I, I might be patriotic and pro-American, and I think I would use those words to describe myself, but how do I apply this in all nations and all times across 2,000 years so I have a consistent biblical ethic? Yes, and I think that's really what I, what I tried my best to do in my book is, I, I mean, obviously I was writing to it, uh, or coming to it as an American, because that's just my context. Uh, but I do believe that the the principles there do apply because it's what the Bible says. And so, but there is, again, there's this great tension of, of how do I submit and honor rather than be patriotic? I think those are different terms, right? And so I think, how do we submit to that government that may be just horribly unjust? And, and one day, let's just be honest, it's going to be a lot more difficult to be a Christian for my kids or my grandchildren than it is today. Sure. And so sure. we're trying to prepare them now that say, hey, listen, you know, you, you, there's going to be a day where it's going to really cost you to be a, a, both a, a Christian and an American. I mean, that's, that day's coming. And, and even, even now in the public square, you're seeing some of that already. Uh, and so there's this, this, this tension that we've got to wrestle with. And, and the, the, the more I got into it and the closer I got to being done with the book, the more I realized, man, this tension isn't going anywhere. And the tension is becoming even tighter. Uh, and I, and I don't I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just it's just this what what we're seeing. And so, you know, we we just got to be careful to and be to see what the Bible says because obviously, you know, when when the Bible is being written, the New, the New Testament church, like, I mean, that kind of, Rome didn't care for Christians. They weren't good. They weren't they weren't treating them well. But yet, the Bible still says pray for them and submit, honor, like uses these terms, even though it wasn't a good. And so. The Bible doesn't say that we su we we submit or that we honor if we agree or that we submit and we honor if they're good. It, it doesn't give any sort of, uh, of 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 an out for that. And so, whether you're Christian with Korea, Russia, or whatever, um, you know, it's still the same. The Bible speaks to all of us in the same way. It's just our context is different. So Adam, like help, help uh, our listeners understand, you know, especially, I mean, there are a lot of pastors that feel disoriented uh, coming out of this, these past two years. And uh, however you feel about January 6th, it, for some, it yep. caused some angst and some disorientation. And um, many want to maintain the ability to say, I love the United States. Um, and I think they, they want to be there. But how do you get to that point without uh, feeling like you're committing some level of idolatry. It's good. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, I, I think idolatry in itself, um, obviously is just always wrong. It's always sinful. Uh, but how does that play itself? How does that flesh itself out at the church level when you're talking about these topics? Um, unfortunately, I think that right now, the, the where we are seeing this, this discussed, it's not really necessarily an issue of patriotism. It's an issue of politics. Okay. And so yeah. I tried my best to make my book about the topic of patriotism without dealing with politics, because I just didn't want to deal with that. But I also recognize we're in a deeply political age. 
And so um, whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican or you're independent, everyone's going to say that they're patriotic, generally speaking. I don't know a whole lot of politicians that are saying, you know what, I hate America. Um, we just have different views of what America ought to be. And so when you're looking at this at the local church level, um, you know, patriotism is becoming a junk drawer term. Um, but because the, the politics are so divided, pastors are in this weird stage where you are afraid to say anything maybe anti-Republican. I mean, that would be my context in the Deep South, you know, that you would you would hate to be critical of Trump or the GOP or this. But then other places you might find yourself saying that you would hate to find yourself agreeing with uh, the Second Amendment or something like that. And so these are po political things that we find ourselves saying, well, if you don't believe this or vote this way or think this way, then you are not patriotic. And I think we've got to, to somehow separate those terms. Um, and I know it's hard to do, though. Uh, and I, don't, I wish I could say I figured that out, but I haven't. Uh, no, that's fascinating. As you, as you were saying it, I was not sure I was tracking with you, but then I realized, no, actually, that's right on. Because when you criticize someone that you may, some of the majority of people or the people in your church agree with politically, they see it as anti-patriotic. And that's that's actually, right. that's really helpful and insightful. Um, so when does, I mean, for me, and I'm concerned, and I've written, I use the word idolatry. Um, when does patriotism become idolatrous? Is there a line uh, how do we see it? I mean, surely there's some point we need to say there are some cautions regarding this. What does that look like? Yeah, and that's the that's the million dollar question. Um, and, Which is and why I'm I having think... you on the podcast to answer that million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, one of one of the things I would would say is that it seems to me that the discussion around that is changing. So my question internally is: is our definition of what's idolatrous in this moment? changing because of the culture or is it changing because of scripture and that's where i have to wrestle with that does that make sense like uh because i think, I think if, so let me see if let me see if i can frame for people to get the cultural connection uh well, we're recording this from the wheaton college billy graham center i would think 50 years ago uh there would be very little concern as billy graham one of my heroes would combine uh patriotism uh americanism and uh, and evangelism. I think it, it felt different 50 years ago. Is that what you're talking about, how the culture kind of moves on right. this marker? Okay. Right, right. So the same things we're doing now 50 years ago wouldn't it would never have been seen as idolatrous. So the question is, is was it idolatrous then, or is the culture simply what's saying it's idolatrous and it's not? Mm -hmm. And I think there's, 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 there's something to flesh out. Um, I'm more prone to think that that maybe we accepted certain things back then because that's just the way things were. I'm more prone to say that we need to be more critical now, but we should have been more critical then. But also we've got to remember that, you know, coming off World War II, things in America just changed. You know, it just did. I mean, we, we, we grew an economy and we started growing and we were inventing things and we were, we were seen as a force for good. And we still have people that fought in World War II alive. And there's just, there's just some of these things that that really did happen. And so where is the line of idolatry? So ultimately, God's going to be the one that has to make that, that call. And that's scary to me um, because at yeah, times I don't... A whole book, you can't write a whole book on it else give us, without giving us some ideas of how we need to be careful. So give, give, us, give, us right. some, give us some insight. Yeah, for me to be careful, I mean, I just, I think, I think your, your services need to be about Jesus. I mean, when we gather, we need to gather to make much about Christ. I don't have a problem speaking on political issues when they're in the text. I like to go through the books of the Bible. I think that's the safest way to do it. That way, when you when there's something staring you in the face, you just deal with it. Um, I, I think that outside of that, you know, for example, you know, I think July 4th is a Monday, I think this year, maybe. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily want to be going around singing a bunch of, you know, God, you know, we don't want to sing praise songs to Jesus on the third, but on the fourth, man, I'm all about, let's shoot some fireworks. Let's wear red, white, and blue. Let's have cookout. Let's, let's celebrate the freedoms that we have. And so I think uh, it's the proper place in that. And so I think if churches can keep the main thing, the main thing, I, I think we're always going to end up being better off. Um, but, but the, the, the concept of what's idolatrous and what's not, I sometimes think that's a very difficult question because some of this is so much subjective. Um, 
but ultimately, uh, we've got to seek our, our, we've got to do our best to make sure we're, we're seeking to honor the Lord. And I think if, if we ask that question, that should help frame what we do as a church or as church leaders. Yeah, I think I'm partly unsatisfied with your answer, but also I get it because I think that Billy Graham yeah. would have answered the question differently 50 years ago. And I do think that that generational thing sure. is a reality is that, you know, I, I'm guessing I'm the oldest of the three of us is, uh, and so when I, the people who often get most upset at me are people who are older. And and again, mm -hmm. I, I may, maybe that's shifting. I don't know. I, what I don't want to lose is that sense of patriotism. I just like, I like to love Jesus, I like to love my country. I just don't like to mix them up. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and I want to be cautious around those, those paths as well. Yeah, but related, I don't, I don't, go ahead, I'm sorry. Related to that, I, you know, I think most, this is from you earlier on uh, when we got started, people have different visions for patriotism. For some, patriotism harkens them, harkens them back to a vision of America, what it used to be. Things are great, yeah. And for some, patriotism is hearkening America to what it's supposed to be or could be. And as a local church pastor, what's the common vision that you provide so you can pull people forward together? Well, I mean, I mean, my common vision is not about America. It's about the gospel. Um, and, and I think, and I, I mean, so that's will be clearly my answer on that. But at the same time, you know, I want to, I want our people to be good, good Christian citizens and love our neighbor and serve our neighbor and be concerned about where we are. When we see evil and injustice, we should speak out because that's biblical. Uh, when when we, we see needs, we want to try our best to meet them. Um, but I think all of that is just rooted in a good understanding of the Bible. Um, you know, I don't know if I've ever in a sermon said, all right, this is God's vision for America. Although I have said things that, that connect to where we are as Americans, you know, and there have been times where we've had, you know, special times of prayer over certain tragedies and things like that. I think that's appropriate. And we, we do do our best to, to pray for leadership, both at our local level and also statewide and national, um, you know, about the closest that that I've really dealt with is, you know, when, 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 when Ukraine was invaded, you know, I, I really felt like, man, I need to, I need to deal with this because I think this is in, injustice that we see. And I also had people that were really concerned, like, Hey, you know, are we about to go to war? And that's a legitimate concern. And so I think, I think you speak into what you see. Uh, but, but again, the gospel has got to be central. Christ has got to be the one magnified. I mean, one day America will be no more. And, and, but yet we will, we will, worship forever at the feet of christ but he but also at the same time you know it says in in revelation 7 that even when we're there there's people of nations and tongues and tribes so somehow even in god's goodness when we're in heaven we still maintain some sense of who we are as a people here and i don't know what to make of that sometimes but uh, but but let's just let's just make much of christ that's what people need people the world doesn't need more americans they need more christians hmm. i was i was struck by i think probably thing, when you have these conversations, I have strong opinions. I, I, I have a lot of strong opinions. Uh, but I was, someone tweeted back to my article, and I always try to listen to my critics, and said, um, and I don't think it's quite what I said, but what he, what he said in response to me made me think a little more. He said, you know, you say pray for the welfare of the city, that it may prosper, you may prosper. How is that different than pray for the welfare of your nation, so that when it prospers, you may prosper? And, and the answer is, is I, I don't think it's substantially different. There were, when that was written, there were city states and, and then empire. Um, and yet we have nations today and we can pray for the good of our nation and work towards its betterment and address some of the issues. You know, 50 years ago, people might've been more comfortable with patriotism, but there are people on the margins then, people of color and others who were still fighting for America to be what its original ideals said it would be. So here's my, my final question, then, then we'll see what Daniel has. What does it look like to be patriotic, involved in the betterment of our nation without being Christian nationalist, which has become a major point of discussion from people as well? And we'll link in the show notes to my article in the Dallas Morning News and some others on what Christian nationalism is. There's a book out on the subject that actually seeks to measure some things around that. Polling uses those things. But, but be patriotic, be involved in bettering our nation, but not end up in that Christian nationalist space. What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think you can, you can, one, you, you can separate what it means to be a good Christian neighbor first. Like, that's my goal, not to be a good Christian voter, but to be a good Christian neighbor, loving my neighbor, serving, being plugged into the church. I think if we're, 
if we're being obedient to scripture, we're going to be making our, our city or our state country, whatever we should be making it better just by being faithful believers. But then there is the side where, you know, you, for us, at least as Americans, where we can vote, you know, that we, we can use the political process that we, we have an opportunity to play in, you know, America is one of those weird places where we still, we still have a vested interest of being active because we can see change. Uh, right. And so I think there you understand that we're both uh, Christians and we're both citizens and we were Christian citizens. But both of those are different uh, sides of the same coin. And so for me, I would say, you know, love your neighbor, serve folks, know the gospel, pray for folks, honor folks, dude, just be good people like we're supposed to be. And then on the other side is like, all right, use the blessings that you have for good. You know, go, go, go play a play a role in politics. It's okay to be a politician. We need good Christian politicians, just like we need good Christian coaches and teachers. Like, you know, let's not look down on people so much that we don't also give them an opportunity to play in that. So uh, I, I think uh, we need to understand that, that we're Christians first and foremost, like we're kingdom, we're in the kingdom of, of Christ and uh, let's make much of that. And I think while we do that, we can also at the same time be good citizens and see our country blessed. You've been listening to Dr. Adam Wyatt. Be sure to check out his book, Biblical Patriotism, an Evangelical Alternative to Nationalism. Thanks again for listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews like this one. You can find other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. We'll see you in the next episode.